And there's a hint of a lost human culture in this. Since the discovery of the Indus Valley civilization, we have to accept that civilization in, in India is, is, is at least 5,000 years old. The huge areas of the world that have never been looked at by archaeology at all. Or if looked at by archaeology, looked at only minimally. Of course, the most important are the flooded continental shelves. And that's why Santa and I spent seven years of our lives uh, scuba diving all around the world. Nestled at the westernmost edge of the Saurashtra Peninsula in what is now the state of Gujarat, India, the ancient city of Dwarka offers a narrative that is as rich in spirituality and mythology as it is in historical urban development. The calculation is that 27 million square kilometers that was above water during the Ice Age is underwater now. The city's strategic positioning near the confluence of the Gomati River and the Arabian Sea played a pivotal role not just in safeguarding it from potential invaders, but also in bolstering maritime trade and fostering connections with other parts of the ancient world. This geographical advantage, coupled with the city being enveloped by water on all sides, either as a peninsula or a series of islands, crafted a natural fortress that was a challenge for any adversary to overcome. Most of human civilization has been organized around water, right? And as the water levels change, some of those ancient cities could be completely covered. We did a lot of diving in southern India, so it was, it was great for her to be able to talk in their own language to Tamil fishermen and Tamil divers and see if they'd seen any weird stuff underwater, which they certainly had. Moreover, the Gomati River's proximity not only enhanced the city's scenic beauty, but also served as a crucial lifeline for its residents. Dwarka's urban landscape, as depicted in ancient texts, was nothing short of architectural grandeur. The city boasted of meticulously planned streets, a state-of-the-art drainage system, and formidable fortifications, all of which were divided into well-defined sectors for residential, commercial, and administrative purposes. We know that it's been underwater for about six or 7,000 years, but the question is, how long before that was it made? How long did it stand there above water? This level of urban planning and civil engineering sophistication showcases an advanced understanding of city management and infrastructure development, making Dwarka a marvel in ancient urban planning. The city's defensive structures, including a series of gates and fortifications, underscored the thoughtful defensive strategy employed in its construction. These were not merely architectural feats, but were strategically designed to regulate access and provide unwavering protection against invasions. Such architectural and strategic prowess points to a high degree of sophistication and indicates that Dwarka was a city that blended beauty with brains, making it a formidable entity in the ancient world. You're coming across statues underwater, you're coming across columns underwater. It's just magical in di diving, diving on an underwater city. Diving into the depths off the coast of modern-day Dwarka in Gujarat, India, archaeologists have embarked on marine explorations that have significantly advanced our understanding of the ancient city's grandeur and the sophisticated civilization that once flourished there. These underwater explorations have brought to light submerged structures, stone foundations, walls, pillars and steps that many believe were part of the legendary Dwarka, a city of immense importance in Hindu scriptures. The discovery of such elaborate underwater architecture points towards the advanced engineering and construction techniques of the time, hinting at a society that was far ahead of its contemporaries in terms of urban planning and infrastructure development. The use of modern technology, including sonar scanning, diving explorations and underwater photography, has been instrumental in mapping out the submerged city, providing us with a clearer picture of its complexity and the scale at which it operated, but the revelations don't stop at structures. A plethora of artifacts unearthed both from the seabed and land excavations near Dwarka tell tales of a culturally rich and economically prosperous society. The remnants of well-laid streets and an elaborate drainage system underscore a high degree of urban planning, indicative of a society that valued organization, environmental health, and the well-being of its citizens. Moreover, the variety of materials discovered suggests Dwarka was a bustling hub of trade and cultural exchange, maintaining connections with other civilizations of its time. This diversity not only showcases the city's economic vitality, but also its cultural openness and dynamism. 
But perhaps what's most fascinating is the chronological evidence unearthed through radiocarbon dating. We have to accept that civilization in, in India is, is, is at least 5,000 years old. The largely and correctly discredited notion of an Aryan invasion of India needs to be abandoned. Some artifacts and structural components of the submerged city have been dated back to the second millennium BCE, aligning Dwarka's timeline with that of Lord Krishna, as described in traditional beliefs and ancient texts. This dating not only cements Dwarka's place as a significant cultural, religious and economic center in the ancient world, but also bridges the gap between mythological narratives and historical reality. These archaeological findings offer a tangible framework to understand the evolution of urban settlements in ancient India, shedding light on societal structures, trade practices, and the cultural dynamics of the time. As we piece together clues from the past, Dwarka holds a special place in the tapestry of Hindu mythology and Indian ancient history, not just for its divine origins, but also for the mystery and majesty that encompass its story. At the heart of Dwarka's legend is its foundation by Lord Krishna, a pivotal figure in Hinduism revered across various traditions. The epic tales from the Mahabharata and the Bhagavata Purana tell us of Krishna's quest to protect his people from persistent threats, leading to the establishment of this city. It wasn't just a random choice, Krishna was strategic, opting for a location that offered natural defenses and prosperous living conditions for his subjects. Positioned on the western coast, Dwarka was a fortress against adversaries, thanks to its geographical advantages and access to vital sea routes that facilitated trade and communication. This city wasn't just a safe haven, it was a symbol of divine protection and ingenuity, blending spiritual significance with architectural splendor. The story of Dwarka, with its grand buildings and eventual mysterious submergence, captures the imagination, making it a subject of fascination and reverence. Dwarka, often hailed as the city of gold in ancient scriptures, embodies not just the literal application of gold in its architecture, but also represents an era of unparalleled wealth, prosperity, and architectural ingenuity. This legendary city, with its palaces shimmering with gold and precious stones, grand public spaces and formidable fortifications, stands as a testament to the zenith of ancient urban development and prosperity. The city's opulence wasn't confined to its material wealth, it extended to its sophisticated design and layout, which were attributed to Vishwakarma, the divine architect in Hindu mythology. Commissioned by Lord Krishna, Vishwakarma's vision for Dwarka was nothing short of architectural brilliance. The planning of Dwarka was meticulously executed, with distinct zones for residential quarters, marketplaces, temples and public buildings. This segregation ensured that the city functioned efficiently, with each area serving its purpose without encroaching on another. The residential quarters, designed for comfort and accessibility, were likely constructed with not just security in mind but also aesthetics, ensuring that the city's inhabitants lived in an environment that was safe, beautiful and harmonious with nature. But perhaps the most captivating tale of Dwarka is its mysterious submergence. The submergence of those sites is largely because of subsidence of land rather than sea level rise, because it's relatively recent. Legend has it that following Lord Krishna's departure from this world, the city met its end, swallowed by the sea. This story isn't just a pivotal chapter in Hindu mythology, marking the end of an era and the onset of Kali Yuga. It has also piqued the interest of archaeologists and historians. Their underwater explorations near the modern city of Dwarka have unearthed submerged structures, offering a tangible link to the city's legendary past. These discoveries hint at the existence of a significant settlement that might have gradually succumbed to rising sea levels or other catastrophic events, giving some historical backbone to the mythological tales. The submergence of Dwarka is often seen through a symbolic lens, reflecting on the ephemeral nature of wealth and the inevitability of change. It reminds us that even the most splendid creations, no matter how grand or well-built, are not immune to the forces of time and nature, this story, rich with historical intrigue and mythological depth, continues to enchant and provoke thought, bridging the ancient with the present and the mythical with the real. If you wish to pass information to a distant future, you wish it to be preserved. Uh, an example I often give is the Indus Valley civilization, but there isn't a single Rosetta Stone that enables us to translate that script into any more recent language. Imagine thriving cities humming with trade, 
homes filled with families and a bustling marketplace. Now in the blink of an eye, picture it all buried, not by volcanic ash like Pompeii, but by the sands of time. The Indus Valley Civilization, one of the world's oldest urban societies, harbored a flourishing culture along the banks of the Indus River. Then, mysteriously, they vanished, leaving behind enigmatic ruins and unanswered questions. Was their disappearance as sudden and calamitous as Pompeii's, or did a slower, more insidious fate seal their destiny? You might think archaeologists always know what they're looking for, but sometimes the most fascinating discoveries come from stumbling across the unexpected. That's the story of the Indus Valley Civilization. Back in the 1800s, explorers in India's northwest region noticed some mysterious ruins and old bricks around a place called Harappa. It didn't seem like a big deal at the time. They figured these were the remains of some relatively recent settlement. Imagine their surprise when the real age of the site was revealed. Decades went by with no major breakthroughs, but in the 1920s, a new director general took over India's archaeological efforts, Sir John Marshall. This guy was determined, and he kicked off organized excavations at those mysterious Harappa ruins. Surprise, surprise, this wasn't anything recent. Marshall and his team unearthed the first solid evidence of an entire unknown civilization and another massive city called Mohenjo-Daro. Think meticulously planned streets, buildings with indoor plumbing, and even a complex drainage system that modern-day city planners could probably learn from. The discoveries were mind-blowing. Think massive granaries suggesting organized food storage, public baths that would rival a modern water park, and workshops indicating specialized crafts within the civilization. And those seals, the ones with an unfamiliar script and animal figures etched onto them hinted at trade, record-keeping, and maybe even early forms of writing. The more they dug, the more it seemed the Indus Valley civilization was far more advanced than anyone imagined. As time went on, even bigger sites like Lothal popped up, showing us how widespread their influence was. With artifacts turning up that looked suspiciously similar to ones from Mesopotamia, it became clear the people here weren't isolated. They had trade networks stretching for miles. Fast forward to today and technology is making things even wilder. Using aerial photography and ground-penetrating radar, we can map out these cities with incredible detail. Scientists are even analyzing everything from pollen to teeth to piece together what the environment was like and how these ancient people farmed, moved goods, and maybe even how their diets changed. It's amazing what we can find hidden in the dirt. Imagine yourself walking the streets of an ancient city but instead of chaotic jumbles of buildings, you see an organized world with wide avenues laid out in a perfect grid. That's what the Indus Valley people built in cities like Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, planned communities that predate most other civilizations by centuries. It's honestly impressive, especially when you realize they used standardized bricks, like ancient Legos making everything neat and uniform, plus those covered drains along the streets, a major upgrade from the open ditches you'd find in a lot of early cities and proof that these folks cared about hygiene. The cities weren't just efficient, they also seemed to have grasped the idea of zoning. Houses in their own area, administrative buildings looking important on a raised mound, and commercial zones bustling with activity. It's not so different from how we separate residential and business districts today. This organized approach likely made life easier for the inhabitants, allowing them to move easily through their cities. They may have even known a thing or two about building with the climate in mind. Archaeologists think streets and houses could have been oriented to catch breezes or make the most of sunlight, showing a surprising grasp of how to make their cities more livable. The Great Bath of Mohenjo-Daro is the ultimate symbol of their ingenuity. It was massive, built on that central mound like it was the most important place in the city, and the engineering behind it is mind-blowing. Each brick was precisely shaped, the walls and floor were waterproofed with some seriously sticky tar, and they had a whole system of pipes bringing in water and taking out the used stuff. Think of it like a mix between an ancient Olympic pool and a Roman-style public bath, a place where rituals and social gatherings may have blended together. It's amazing that this structure survived for so long. The Great Bath gives us a detailed peek into how they constructed things and how they managed to make their cities function in surprisingly modern ways. It begs the question, what other marvels from ancient times are out there, just waiting to be unearthed? The folks in cities like Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro built their storehouses with the big picture in mind. 
They knew a well-stocked granary meant a fed and happy city. Those raised platforms weren't just for show. They kept the grain safe from rats and dampness. Plus, they had these clever air vents throughout, almost like a primitive air conditioning system to keep everything fresh. It's honestly pretty genius, and definitely not how most other ancient societies were storing their food. The size of these granaries is seriously impressive. They weren't just stashing a few bushels for themselves. These cities were ready to manage a whole surplus of grain. That means organized farming, trade routes, and probably some solid record keeping to make it all work. We even have remnants of a sophisticated drainage and sanitation system right in the granary district. These people were meticulous planners. But let's talk about defense. Indus Valley cities had their own version of a fortress think raised areas called citadels, maybe a bit like a medieval castle on a hill. These imposing structures likely served as a place where the important stuff and important people could retreat if times got rough. Then there were the massive city walls, which were meant to keep out both floods and any unwelcome visitors. The funny thing is though, there isn't much evidence of actual warfare in the Indus Valley. Makes you wonder if those walls were more for show, a kind of don't even think about messing with us statement. Now here's something truly mind-blowing. The dockyard at Lothal. It's like stepping back in time and seeing how seriously these people took seafaring. Imagine a bustling harbour scene. Ships coming in, cargo being moved, a whole network of trade happening right before your eyes. With this dock, they were connected to distant lands like Mesopotamia, trading not just stuff, but ideas and culture too. Think about how impressive this engineering is, they built a whole dock system to manage tides. Fired bricks created a sturdy structure. These weren't just lashing some boats together. They knew the water, planned for its movements, and built something that lasted thousands of years. Who knows how much we can learn from their successes, even when it comes to building our own modern ports and managing trade today. It's wild how two ancient cities, so far apart and with totally different fates, can still tell us so much about how people lived thousands of years ago. The thing that really sticks out, when you compare Mohenjo-Daro and Pompeii, is how organized both were. Mohenjo-Daro had an almost modern-looking grid system, built with precision and focused on keeping things flowing smoothly. It's clear that they put a lot of thought into things like water management and hygiene, which wasn't always the case back then. Pompeii, on the other hand, still had organization, but with a bit more of that Roman flair. Their streets had a curve to them, leading the eye toward important places. It was more about making a statement while still being functional. The buildings themselves are another huge difference. Mohenjo-Daro was primarily brick, solid and practical, while Pompeii had that classic Roman mix of stone and concrete, embellished with all sorts of beautiful artwork. It makes you wonder who lived in these cities. Mohenjo-Daro is still kind of mysterious, almost like everyone was more or less on the same level. But with Pompeii, you can see the different social classes reflected in the houses, from the huge, colorful villas of the rich to the smaller homes and workshops of everyday Romans. You can't help but picture the hustle and bustle, the politicians in the forum, the customers in the shops, all frozen in time by the volcano. Mohenjo-Daro had art too, of course. Think seals with intricate carvings and pottery with all sorts of fascinating designs. But Pompeii takes it to the next level with colorful frescoes on the walls, mosaics in the floors and statues everywhere, like walking through an ancient art gallery. Their endings couldn't be more different. Mohenjo-Daro kind of faded away, with historians still trying to figure out exactly why. Was it a shifting river? A drought? A trade route changing? Pompeii, well, we know what happened there, a catastrophic eruption that buried the city in ash, but also preserved it incredibly well. It's both tragic and strangely beautiful. In the end, they're both pieces of the giant, messy puzzle of human history. Mohenjo-Daro shows us a society that valued function and planning, while Pompeii is a burst of Roman culture and chaos. And the fact that we're still uncovering the secrets of both, that's what makes archaeology so fascinating. <laughs>